So I think now if we could go and see the presentation of Mark Basim, and if Mark would like to talk us through it, that would be great. Okay, we can click, we can just move through it. Do you want? Okay. All right. So we'll be uh, talking, giving a brief talk about meringoplasty, showing a video at the end of it, and then we'll head on to the panel discussion. I know Chris has a lot of good questions uh, prepared for this discussion. So the simple definition of a meringoplasty or type 1 tympanoplasty is a repair of the tympanic membrane without manipulation of the ossicle. So it's typically done for uh, perforations of the, the tympanic membrane, as seen in the top pictures, or uh, for retraction pockets that are re uh, resected and then uh, you know, patched over like a primary perforation. Uh, next. Thank you. Okay, working. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Just shout loud. It's all right. It's okay. It's fine. It's going fine. So the, the basic principle is that we have to place an autologous scaffold, a graft, to allow growth of the indigenous uh, epithelial cells of the tympanic membrane from fresh edges to heal the perforation. So essentially, we just got to pro provide some structure for the epithelial cells to grow or walk over uh, to repair the uh, perforation spontaneously. Next, please. The concepts we're going to talk about and probably expand on a little bit more in the panel discussion are the material, what material is packing, do we pack or do we not pack, uh, which approach do we use, is it post auricular, transcanal, endoscopic, under labors overlay, uh, and uh, we'll probably skip over the outcome, just discuss that in the panel discussion at the end. Next slide, next two slides, which we'll skip. Thank you. So a good graft uh, should have obviously good biocompatibility. It should be resistant to infection and resorption. And at the end of, of uh, the day after surgery, it should have minimal effect on hearing, uh, meaning does not cause any conductive hearing loss or add to an existing conductive hearing loss. Next, please. The most common, uh, commonly used graft is the temporalis fascia. It's easily obtainable. You can get a large piece of fascia. It will cover any perforation. It has just about the right thickness, which is 0 0.3 millimeters. Uh, it has, if you're using a postauricular incision, it has minimum morbidity. You're already there, so you just harvest the fascia. Uh, and if you do it in a traumatic way, it really doesn't cause any pain or any discomfort in the side of harvest. And it can be used for both underlay and overlay. Next, please. The next, the second most common is probably the perichondrium. Uh, it's also easily obtainable. It's a smaller area than the fascia, and it is thinner than fascia. So it, you know, it can be uh, potentially uh, sometimes too thin in cases of retraction, in cases of uh, poor ventilation, in cases of chronic infections. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but again, you know, with, with the proper techniques, it has minimal morbidity, uh, no pain, no complications. So, uh, I think if we click your. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the closure rates for both fascia and perichondrium, if you look at the literature, they're up to 97%. Uh, there's about a 2% risk of free perforation in, in healthy ears. I know we've talked uh, previously in the, some of the panels uh, about the, the importance of the health of the mid ear in these surgeries. Uh, in cases where there is uh, concern about chronic otitis media, the re perforation rate is up to 14%. And this is a discussion about, you know, uh, how to properly prepare the ears before proceeding with such surgery, mean, making sure that the middle ear mucosa and the ventilation is as healthy as possible before proceeding with the repair. Next, please. So with, with these concerns, uh, people have talked about using cartilage. Cartilage can be obtained from the tragus or from the concha. Uh, it gives you more stiffness, more rigidity. It is more resistant to uh, infections and rejection pockets. And if you look at the literature, the techniques, there are different ways to use it. You can use it separately. You can use the composite graft with the perichondrium intact. You can use one piece, palisades. It's just, you know, depending on what you want it for, where you want it in the tympanic membrane, under the tympanic membrane, and what your preferred method is. Next, please. So the issue with cartilage uh, is the thickness of it. Some would argue that some people have a cartilage that's too thick. It's 1 to 1.2 millimeters on average, and that might affect the uh, transmission and the mechanics and eventually the hearing outcomes. Uh, you can thin it. You can slice it to half, a, half the size, uh, either manually with a blade or there are some uh, special sets out there. There are cartilage slicers. 
Uh, the effect on hearing in, in different grafts uh, between 0 0.01 and 0 0.5 millimeters up to 0 0.5 millimeters has been studied in the lab, and there was really no effect on hearing in any of this thickness. Next, please. So the question always with cartilage is, is it better? Uh, this is a good study that I like from a few years ago that compared fascia uh, to uh, cartilage and perichondrium for tympanoplasty. And the outcomes that we'll talk about the next slide also, that there is, in general, at least in this study, which was the biggest review, is there's no statistically significant difference between the two techniques in healing and in hearing outcomes. However, there's a trend to favor the cartilage because there's probably a little bit of a selection bias that you know, surgeons naturally tend to use. Surgeons like, for example, myself, when I don't use cartilage in every single case, I tend to use it in the cases where I have some concerns about you know, uh, the health of the mid-ear, possible recurrence of the retraction pocket. So there is a selection bias overall, but probably what this tells you is that if you choose the right procedure for the right ear, then the outcomes are the same. There's no difference in the outcomes. Next, please. And then next one. Okay, uh, that's the, actually yeah, the fat one, the next one. Okay. So the, the, the third uh, graph that we can use is fat, okay? And you can, we can harvest the fat from the lobule, that's the most common area. Uh, you can get it from the nuchal area, from the back of the neck under the hairline. You can get big pieces of fat from the abdominal or gray umbilical areas. We all do this for uh, trans-labyrinthine procedures or trans-temporal approaches. Uh, the nice thing about fat is that it has a high tensile strength. It's resistant to uh, infections. It's easy to manipulate, to manipulate, excuse me, it's relatively slow to resorb, meaning it gives enough time for the perforation to heal completely. Yet, you know, about six months probably out, you look in the ear and there's nothing you can't even tell where it was. Now, so we're all used to using fat for smaller perforations, the ones that we get after tube removal. Um, but what the question is, can we use them for larger perforations? And if you can put the next slide, please. Uh, the, based on some of the studies, uh, especially the ones from uh, Isam Saliba in Canada, promoted the use of uh, uh, fat graft for larger perforations uh, with hyaluronic acid uh, supplements. Uh, he, he found a total perforation, I'm sorry, total success rate of up to 88% in total perforations, large perforations, like you see in this picture below. So I have personally been using it more and more for larger perforations, maybe not for the total, but for probably perforations that are 40, 50%. And I have been very good with the also thing, and in terms of the hearing. Um, the next question, the next question we always ask is the approach. In the approach, there are two things we discussed. So we're having a bit of problem with the sound at the moment, Mark. There's a lot of interference and we've lost you a little bit. Uh, I'm sure Wilco will help us with that in a minute. I'm working on it, John. Uh, uh, Chris, you're a co-host now. I'm trying to get Tom Ronald in. Uh, and he should be... Okay. Uh, okay, continue, Mark. Where, where did you lose me? No, not much, I think. One minute, 30 seconds, I think. Yeah, try again. Try again from where you are. Yeah, Mark, are you there? Do you want to talk yeah. us through the approaches? Chris, do you Okay, approaches. So we're, we'll talk about the, uh, you know, the, the decision between a post-surgical and transplant approach depends on the canal size, if you have the next slide, yeah, and the configuration. The canals, some canals, and here, uh, which your view, especially this, the wood, depending on what your perforation is. Uh, it really depends on your comfort. Uh, person, for example, I have been doing now the majority of these cases through a trans-canal approach using the microscope. And of course, the perforation. So, a small posterior perforation is much easier to approach through a trans canal approach uh, as compared to a subcortical or anterior perforation with somebody with a narrow canal. So, it all really comes down to exposure. Whatever gives you the best exposure will eventually give you the best outcome. So, go with that. The next question is do we use an underlay or an overlay approach? Next, please. And I just want to take a second to define the difference between underlay and overlay because sometimes it's confused, you know. People think that it's underlay if you go under the malleus handle and overlay if you go over the malleus handle. The other terms for it is medial graft and lateral graft, but really the definition is whether you put your graft 
under the uh, annulus or in the fibrous layer or lateral to the annulus and the fibrous layer. And that the, the malleus has nothing to do with that. That being said, however, uh, you know, what's the difference? People would probably argue that the underlay approach is easier. It's faster, faster surgery and it's faster healing because it's less involved surgically. Uh, the argument against it has always been that it has a lower success rate in subtotal and anterior perforations. The overlay, because you're essentially taking everything apart and just putting it, you know, putting the ear back together, it has a higher success rate. Uh, the proponents argue that it's a more natural approach because you're putting the fibrous graft where the fibrous layer is. Uh, but it is a longer surgery and it is more involved as a surgery, so there are potentials for more complications and a slower healing. Next. Uh, we did mention the malleus handle, so I want to say that people have looked at everything really in, in the type 1 tympanoplasty, and whether you place your graft medial or lateral to the malleus handle does matter. It doesn't matter a lot, but for example, this study looked at uh, the outcomes, the hearing outcomes, when the graft was placed medial to the malleus. Uh, we, we had about a 5 or 6 decibel improvement compared as a group uh, to the ones where the graft was placed lateral. Uh, this is a couple of slides about, these are a couple of slides about loop tympanoplasty, which is an approach our group has uh, discussed and reported, which is somewhere in between. It's a kind of a medial and lateral approach. And we essentially make a big incision and superiorly based uh, tympano, uh, uh, tympanomietal flap. We lift it up, as you'll see, the annulus and the fibrous layer up. We Just the next, please. And the next, and then we put the graft medial to that, and then in the next slide you'll see we bring it back down, and, and this with with anterior perforations, and it avoids some of the common uh, complications of a lateral graft, just, such as blunting or lateralization. The last point we'll discuss is the packing. Do you pack or do you not pack the middle ear? Um, I when I was when I was training. Uh, it was not even an issue. Everybody I knew packed the middle ear. And then I started talking to surgeons in international conferences and realized some people don't think you need to pack. Packing, briefly, uh, if we go to the next slide, packing was introduced a while back. Uh, the goal of uh, gel foam packing specifically is to support the tympanic membrane, ossicular grafts if you have them, allow aeration of the middle ear, potentially uh, deliver some, you know, if you soak them in, in antibiotics and steroids, deliver some medication to the middle ear, to a middle ear that's inflamed. And of course, gel foam has hemostatic uh, properties. The problems with it is that you tend to get adhesions, you can tend to get fibrosis, and potentially some would argue that it would delay the healing uh, of your graft because you're, you know, you're putting a foreign material there. Uh, next one. So the gel foam is uh, typically absorbed in two to nine weeks, and it is absorbed by phagocytosis. Uh, it's not really evacuated through the eustachian tube. Most of it is uh, absorbed by phagocytosis. Uh, temporarily, because you're putting packing in the middle ear, you can get a hearing loss of up to 40 decibels of a conductive hearing loss. Um, and the fibrosis has been shown to be reduced if you use antibiotics and steroid solution in, uh, to soak the gel foam when you need it. So the answer for packing is, my answer at least, is don't pack if you don't have to. Uh, and if you have to pack, pack lightly. You don't have to fill the entire middle ear pack where you think your graft needs support and do use the antibiotic and steroid suspension uh, because it will replace it. So the final answer we've talked about a lot of components is, uh, you know, which graft do you use? Which approach do you use? Do you pack or do you not pack? It, we've shown that the studies are equivalent, so it doesn't matter. But I say in this slide, it doesn't matter until it does, meaning I think you have to think of every single one of these components when you're approaching intermenic membrane perforation uh, and choose what you think works best for this patient, for this perforation, for their ear canal, for their history in terms of their middle ear uh, biology and middle ear, you know, previous history. And of course, for your comfort and your surgical skills. So, you know, if you, you select the proper combination of these factors, your outcomes are going to be excellent in the majority of cases. Um, so we'll move on to a short video about a fat graft meningoplasty. Uh, I think if we go to the last slide, it will hopefully play on its own. So this is a small perforation, as you see. Um, we're doing a transcanal approach. Oops, all right, that's not funny. Mark, it's not playing by itself. Sorry. Okay. Well, what Sorry, would life be? What would life be without surprises?
Yeah, well, there you go. Just uh, throw a curveball every now and then. Okay. Uh, so, okay, uh, Mark, just, Mark, maybe just yes. uh, if you just describe your technique to us, that'd be great. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I do a transcanal approach. I do give local anesthetic. We've discussed this, uh, you know, in, in different panels. I use uh, 1% lidocaine with one in 10,000 epinephrine. So I take a, a syringe. This is a, 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 an interesting trick I learned. I, I take a one cc sir, syringe. I put 0.9 uh, cc's of uh, lidocaine, 1% lidocaine, and I add 0 0.1 mils of a one in a thousand uh, epinephrine. So that gives me really good hemostasis. Uh, the next step is after I wash the ear uh, and remove the excess uh, wax and debris, I just rim the perforations using a sharp pick. Do uh, like a, a, a reset pattern. Then I remove the edges. In the, in the case of a pack wrap, I do like a piece of gel foam, insert it through the perforation, kind of prepare a bed for for the fat, and then I harvest the fat depending on on the patient. I get either from the lobule or from just the hairline here. You can get just enough fat uh, with minimal morbidity. I close that incision with an absorbable uh, subcutaneous stitch or two. And then I take the fat graph and literally just put it on, the, you know, push it through the perforation. One thing you got to be make sure of is you don't have any loose uh, edges that kind of tend to curve in and then uh, end up in a coliseatoma down the, you know, a few years down the line. So once I push the fat, I just take a, uh, an angled instrument and I make sure all these edges are raised. So it's really, you know, the perforation edges are flat against the, the graft. And uh, I put another piece of gel foam or some antibiotic ointment in the ear. Uh, and then they're on their way. You can do this under local easily. Uh, you can do it under general, whatever whatever is your preference. Uh, but it's a very easy technique. It takes literally about 15 minutes for perforations. You saw the perforation in the video. It was about a 15% perforation, but you can do the same for perfs up to 40, 50%. It's very easy and very quick. Chris? Great. Well, thank you very much, Mark. So don't worry about the video. We'll have plenty of time to chat through, and I think you explained that very nicely. So what we're going to do now, we're going to look at um, some cases. I hope we'll be able to just see the odd slide, Wilco. Okay. Yes, and, uh, um, Chris, Chris, can yep. we say hello to uh, Professor Ali uh, Marus from uh, uh, Cairo? Yes. Of course. That'd be oh, great. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to meet you. I think you missed us at the beginning. Uh, so I'd just like no, to introduce he was there. my he panel. Was there. He was there. Uh, very he nice, hello, everyone. Very no nice to see issue. you, Professor <laughs> Marus. And we have... And Thank we have you. Um, Professor Rowland. And we've got Thomas Rowland on. Yes. We've got uh, Thomas Rowland online. I'll just bring him in so uh, we can see you, Tom. Uh, great to have you with us. Uh, and we've got uh, Professor Saji da Costa from Porto Alegre in Brazil. Always looks sunny there. You always seem to be on the beach, Saji. Uh, I'm, I'm very surprised. To, surprised, <laughs> surprised you don't have a beer in your hand. What's wrong with you? <laughs> well, okay. Uh, just enjoy the sun here. Okay, and we've also had uh, Mark Basim. So, Wilco, I don't know, is it possible to just put up some of those slides that I sent to you earlier? Will that be possible? <laughs> yes, I'm looking for them right now. You're looking for uh, them. Yeah. You drop them on the floor. Drop the yeah, carousel. You, you, right you know how that works, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yes, Chris, um, talk about COVID for a while. <laughs> okay, be, well, we could I'll, do that. Let's do that. Uh, Let's uh, talk uh, about co them, COVID. Okay. Yeah. And just if we can just, we've, we've mentioned this in previous meetings. Chris, to so be sure, perhaps, you, sorry, sorry about yeah. this. You sent them the last 24 hours, didn't you? No, no, no. No, I sent them about a week ago. It's, All right, uh, okay. I'll find them. Plus, uh, okay. plus, yeah. Um, Chris, can I just... It's the Moringa Plasti. Yep. Chris, sorry, can I just Dwayne. ask Mark, there's just a question, and I think it's pertinent to his uh, fat graph. The question comes from the... From Mike Waring, he's just asking: Does the fat go right through the perforation, or is it an underlay uh, graft? I think it, the answer is a self-explanatory, Mark. But won't you just give Mike a little bit more info on that? Yeah. So, so as a concept of, it is an underlay graft. Eventually, when it sits there, it's sitting under the uh, tympanic membrane in the middle ear, obviously under the tympanic membrane and under all layers of the tympanic membrane. So per the definition of an underlay graft, it is an underlay graft. And I do put it through the perforation because I think it's easy, especially when I do it for smaller perforation. I don't think it's worth raising a tympanometal flap. Uh, and uh, I've even done that, what I call the push through, push through the perforation. I've, I've sometimes done it for grafts like perichondrium or, or temporalis fascia for the smaller perfs. I just, just lay a bed of gel foam and push it through, push the graft through the perforation, and then make sure everything is nice and flat and the edges are averted. Thanks, Mark. Okay, 
question great. from India. Question from India. Do you use a wet or dry graft uh, for any reason? From Dr. Tinjanka in India. Who are you asking, yeah, John? Uh, this is a general question to the uh, panel. And so doing what we're going to do, John, I think we're going to just go through and just look at some basic cases and get people's okay. over their general view, and then we'll open up right. to the, the. Is that okay? Because I think we'll yeah. probably cover quite a few of those issues. That's I don't fine. Know just just if we've got an, Yeah, sure. Have we got any slides, Wilco, or or not? Uh, the sure. slides will be there in uh, as soon as uh, the mail comes in, and I'll okay. get them. So <laughs> give me another. Uh, okay. All right. Give me another three minutes or so. So, so it's it's a moringa moringaplasty round table. It's called anyway. So, so basically, what we're going to start off with is your general approach. And the first case I was going to show you is a straightforward, clean, dry ear with a posterior superior perforation in a 36-year-old male. Uh, with a 15 decibel uh, hearing loss. And he's complaining not of infection, but of pain on swimming. So the first question, and I'd like to start off with Tom uh, in New York. I'll go around all of you and give you all a good chance to, to speak. But this is a straightforward one, Mark. Um, are you, what, what would you say to your patient in terms of the chance of closing this perforation? Uh, is hearing loss about 15 decibels down? What's the chance of improving his hearing? So those two questions when you're sitting in the clinic. Thomas, we've got no sound from you at the moment. I think you're muted. If you just unmute. That's great. Yeah. So what's... Do you hear me, do you hear me now? Yeah, we hear you now. That's great. Thanks, Thomas. <clears throat> okay. Sorry, I'm connected via phone and watching you on Zoom. I had some technical issues this morning, but... Um, so we've got a nice so view of your ear at the moment. Um, okay. That's better. That's better. I'm talking, I'm talking to the, the telephone speaker. Um, okay. So I, I, um, I would say if the other ear is normal, which is kind of an, to, to me, a barometer that is eustachian tubes are probably working quite well. I would say, you know, we have 90% chance of closing the perforation with proper technique and maybe a slightly less chance of improving uh, the, the mild conductive hearing loss. Okay, that's great. So and when you have that discussion to him, so you say there's a 90% chance of it working, does that mean there's a 10% chance of the graft failing and left with a perforation? Well, I would say either it doesn't take and it fails, he gets a post-operative infection from some re for some reason, or maybe he gets another otitis media um, down the line, you know, within the first year after fixing it, and he reperforates. I sort of okay. have those kind of just. And, and that sort of 10%, then they're left with a similar situation. They've got a perforation. What's the chance of making him worse, making his hearing worse, would you say? I would tell patients, you know, with careful technique that I probably won't make your hearing worse. Uh, I, I guess if he were to have some horrendous infection and a lot of scarring and fibrous tissue, we could have more of a conductive hearing loss or even make the perforation bigger. But I would say that the risk of making his hearing worse is pretty low, very low. What does that mean? One or two percent, something like that? You think? Yeah, I, I, I don't, nothing's 100 percent. So maybe five percent is a reasonable number. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> and what about other uh, other risks that you were taught this? He's a thick guy. He's got normal canal, dry perforation. What other risks of surgery would you mention? It's poster is superior. So the cord is not far away. Yeah. So um, I would tend to do these. I do almost all my small posterior tympanoplasties under local anesthesia uh, in an outpatient setting. So I would say the risk of surgery itself and anesthesia to him uh, because of his comorbidities is very low. Um, I would say that, you know, we could interrupt the cord of tympani. Um, many times they don't even notice in these chronic years because the cord has already been somewhat dysfunctional and they've compensated. Um, but so you might have a taste sensation. Your, your taste for wine might become worse. Uh, you, might, you know, taste disturbance. Um, I would say the chances of vertigo or tinnitus or sensory neural hearing loss from rocking the ossicles too much is very, very low. But we do discuss the possibility of, you know, getting a sensory neural hearing loss. But that I think for a simple posterior superior perforation, um, those those risks are, are fairly low. Okay. I do. So we... I, I incorporate cartilage, so I would say I I think that by incorporating a a thin piece of cartilage, I probably reduce the risk of reperforation uh, as well. 
OK, so Chris. tell us how you're going to do it now. So he's decided Chris, Chris. he wants surgery. Chris, one second. Uh, Chris, um, is, the, is yeah. the presentation with the 243 slides that I just uploaded? 243 slides. <laughs> uh, it is. Well, I don't think so. OK, well, it's the uh, first few slides anyway. It's, it's Moringa Plastic <laughs> Round Table. It's is, just is, the first few slides. Is this the one? I don't... Okay, please confirm. No, no, it's it's Moringa Plasti. That's a secular plasti. Okay, but this is 243 slides. So this is the one yeah, I it's got. Not that. It's not that. It's not that. Okay, it's thank plasti. God. Yeah. Anyway, don't worry. Um, so, Tom, so you've got your patient there and uh, he's consented. Uh, how are you actually going to repair this hole? So, I would, you know, prep the patient, clean out the ear canal with. Um, with uh, air, saline, inject him with uh, lidocaine with epinephrine, um, make a uh, relatively large posterior tympanometal flap going from, oh, maybe if 12 o'clock is the uh, short process of the malleus, I would maybe go 12 to 11, uh, 11, a, 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock all the way inferiorly, raise a tympanometal flap, lift up the annulus, uh, explore the middle ear, try to remove any fibrous tissue, uh, irrigate out the ear. Oftentimes in chronic perforations, there's a little polyp, uh, inflammatory polyp near the eustachian tube opening. You can kind of explore that. Um, then I would um, rim the perforation. I sometimes uh, split my flap to have a superior and inferior flap, and that way it allows you just to take a Bellucci scissors or a small, uh, small pick and rim, rim the edges very nicely to create fresh edges. Um, I will have um, probably just transcanal. I would have gotten a uh, tragal cartilage and a big piece of tragal perichondrium. I pressed the perichondrium ahead of time. Uh, do that first, obviously, then thin the cartilage, trim it to size. Uh, I put a bit, a few pieces of gel foam in the middle ear, lay the cartilage in on top of that, and then slide the graft over the cartilage. Sometimes it's easier to put the graft in first, goes under the malleus and up the canal wall and then lay the cartilage under that, and then uh, and then rotate my flaps, uh, superior and inferior flaps. Sometimes when you split the flap, uh, you can um, rotate the the uh, uh, the flaps a little bit more medially, and that way you can reduce the size of the perforation to heal, and you leave a little bit of gap on the canal wall, which heals very well. And then I would pack the external auditory canal with um, some gel foam with an antibiotic drop on it, like that's good. Project, okay, I'm going, to so I'm going to stop you there, yeah. if that's okay, Tom. Just the one yeah. thing that I, yeah. I picked up. You did you say that you made a really quite a large incision from 12 right round to 11, or or is it just from 12 down to six? No, from 12, 11, 12. I meant I meant okay. 11 a.m. Okay. to 12. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Down to six. Yes. Sorry, six I didn't go all the way around. Fine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. And you put the graft in in two pieces. You put cartilage and perichondrium. Yeah, I usually do. Uh, I usually separate the perichondrium from the cartilage. I know some of us at my center will leave the perichondrium on the cartilage and just use one graft, but I like to lay the, make sure the perichondrium's under the malleus and tucked in very nicely, and then a smaller piece of cartilage uh, just under the perforation. That's great. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to Saji now in Porto Alegre. Uh, so, Professor Da Costa, this is a straightforward, clean, dry ear with a posterior superior perforation. How do you repair these? Uh, well, good morning from Brazil. Uh, I would basically I'm gonna do the, the same thing that Dr. Roland said. Uh, we used to do uh, meningoplasty either through transcanal approach or if the perforation is too big or the anterior border it's it's hard to see. I would prefer to go with a retroauricular. Uh, Asking about the endoscope, it's a mandatory question for this kind of thing. In very small uh, perforations, then I, I think you can use also the endoscopes. Uh, the problem, Chris, is that uh, maybe I'm a lousy surgeon. We don't have 97% of closure. I don't know. You know, I have less than that. And, and another thing, it's uh, even in Brazil, that's a poor country, you don't see this real nice perforations anymore, you know, like kidney-shaped perforations. That's its rarity. What we see uh, all the time, and we have written about that many times, is that uh, there are perforations where clear signs with previous retraction. And I think that these perforations are purely the end result of eustachian tube dysfunction, retraction, and then perforation. 
And as Professor Rowland said, the other year it's extremely important to analyze to see if this concept holds true in that particular case. So uh, in this kind of perforation, I would do the same. But sometimes I would uh, change the graft, and we can discuss that later. But yeah, we can we're going to come on to more complex ones later. So right. I really wanted to know what your standard technique was from a relatively standard, straightforward one. In, in so do you, do you in, use in, cartilage in, and perichondrium separately or together? No, no. In a perforation like that, I would use fascia. Right. Okay. Uh, I use cartilage, and sometimes what I say, double, uh, double uh, graft uh, tympanoplasty with cartilage and fascia, in cases with a previous retraction, in cases of failure, or basically those two situations. Okay. So in a straightforward one like this, you're using fascia, but are you going down the canal or are you going end oral? It's a posterior superior perforation. It's well, easy to see. Uh, Depend on the canal. If the canal, so you've got a easy, nice canal, nice canal, yeah, easy canal. Cast canal, you can do through trans canal approach. And then, do you still take fascia? You say oh, make yeah. a separate incision for fascia. It's a split like this. It's yeah. not a big okay. deal. Okay, that's good. You you, you can so, you can do also hold a second. You can do also end roll if you want. If the canal is not so bad but it's not so good, you can do some uh, end roll incisions, and you can get the fascia here from the superior pole of your incision, and also do the job. So, Saji, it's not a big, not a big Saji, deal at all. It's not what I want. It's what you do that we want to know. The, the, everyone's listening to know what you you do. So all these <laughs> questions, I know people do different things, but I want to know what you do. Exactly what I said. Depends yeah, on the canal. Perfect. If it's perfect. a perfect, oh, let me say, if it's a perfect canal, I will do it trans canal with the speculum. If it's not so great, but not so bad, you could do endoral with endoral incisions and get the fascia from the superior pole of your incision. If it's, I want to have a canaloplasty or the work is gonna be more intense in the middle year, I will do retroregular. That's, that's the way that's, I do. That's great, brilliant, thank you. What I'd like to know from the panel in general, is, is there anybody who uses uh, uh, alternative non-human tissues, so tutor patch, alloderm, any other materials other than fascia or perichondrium? Anybody use that? Uh, Chris, Chris, yeah, can I hi, make a comment Professor. on the previous question? Hi, yes, please hi do. there. Please do. Um, actually, in terms of the question that you've asked about the posterior superior central perforation, I would, in these situations, I would try to make a, a clear distinction uh, <clears throat> whether the eustachian tube is functioning well or not uh, by looking at the contralateral ear. And if the contralateral ear looks normal, uh, with a, with a well-aerated middle ear, I would actually uh, approach uh, the ear with a perforation uh, through the transicanal approach using just peri uh, perichondrium, tragal perichondrium, without using a cartilage. But if the eustachian tube function is not, uh, is not well, then I would then actually make a case and, and use the cartilage as well as uh, the perichondrium. Thank you very much. That's exactly what I do, in fact. Um, Mark, okay. what, yes. what's your Just thoughts on this? It's a straightforward one. I got the question. Yeah, I got that question from Dwayne earlier about the, the, the push through. This is the kind of perforation, the posterior superior, probably the one exception where a push through is a bit risky because of what you've already mentioned. You know, the cord is right there, the ossicles are right there. So you, I don't feel comfortable just pushing it blindly. So even for a tiny perf, I would raise it in pyramidal flap like Dr. Roland and, and Dr. Dacosta said. Uh, I just I feel more comfortable for these perforations, no matter how raising them, dissecting carefully, making sure I preserve the cord because sometimes it's stuck to the under uh, side of it, and then just you know taking a peek at the ossicles in that in that uh, perforation. Uh, that's great. So I'm going to go on to Robert. I think Robert, you're part of this panel. Is that correct, or are you not? Uh, not really. Okay. But I can, I can, I can. Uh, no, okay. he's well, not. He, he, he does a very nice moringoplasty, but he's not part well, of the panel. What, what, what I'll, it. Yeah, perhaps you can tell us because I've, I've seen you do moringoplasties, and this so this <coughs> case, Robert, it's quite a straightforward case. It's a small posterior superior perforation, 15 decibel loss, um, clean and dry, with a nice canal. How would okay. you repair that? 
it's the posterior perforation? Is that right? Posterior is superior. So it's sort of over the incontestibilial joint, but it's a small perforation, about okay. two millimeters. It's not on the annulus. There's, this is a straightforward, non dodgy one. We've got yeah, plenty yeah. of dodgy ones coming up, but this is a straightforward well, one. In that case, I would use a perichondrium and I would do transcanal and then uh, I do a regular one. I mean, I don't see any uh, problem with that. No, so you do, uh, you make a small flap and do an underlay graft. Is that what you do? Yes, oh, I just elevate the tympanic membrane and then put the, the graft, but I will probably dissect the, the malleus handle. I like to put my graft over the malleus handle. So okay. over the malleus handle and over the poster wall. So it's overlay, underlay, or anything like that. Yeah, so, okay. So Mark explained that a little bit. So basically, and that's routine for you. Always raise it off the malleus handle. Yes, always. Do you not worry about that you're moving the acicular chain and that maybe that's just slightly unnecessary? Yeah, there's always a risk with that, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember having any big trouble with that. So it seems to be fine. I mean, some people sometimes dislocate incus from stapes gently to, to be sure that they will go to trauma. <coughs> I don't do that myself. I just elevate the, uh, the flap like this and dissect the malice without separating the, the incus from the stapes. So, okay, I'm going to go back to the rest of the panel. I'll bring you back, Robert, later, but I'm going to go back to the rest of the panel. Yeah, if just, I, just I, I, I come back sometime, right? Yeah, I, we'll, keep, right? An so we'll keep an eye. We'll keep an eye. I, I, I changed my shirt because Saji told me that my shirt was not good. So I changed it, for <laughs> it, was pretty, it was really loud. Eh? <laughs> so, so what we'll do, Robert, we'll keep an eye on the room. And if you're not there, we'll be very rude about the French. And if you are there, we'll try and be nice. Okay, okay. Good. great. That's great. Can I just ask the other members of the panel, was, does anybody else do that for a small posterior superior perforation? Would they actually take the drum off the malleus handle to put their graft lateral to it? Can I just ask you, it, it does, if you raise your hand, if you would do that routinely? Uh, Mark, tell us what you uh, do. Oh, routinely, no. Yeah, no. Oh, so, oh, okay, I so I, 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 I do do it, but I wouldn't do it routinely. Uh, right. Can I so just go, uh, dress? I'm going to have to take you guys one at a time. So if you're on the panel and you want to speak, just raise your hand and I'll bring you in. Um, Mark, were you wanting to comment on that? I do. Just to, so uh, you know, I explained yeah. my slide where I said you know uh, putting it lateral to the malleus handle uh, has been shown to reduce the outcomes in terms of hearing slightly. Uh, that being said, I, I agree with Robert that at least sometimes you do need to do that and you can do that in a very atraumatic way. If your perforation is right at the edge of the, right at the malleus, you do need some support. So I would tend to dissect the tympanic membrane from the malleus. I incise the periosteum with a sharp pick on the malleus and then it's, it's literally very easy to peel and get a clear plane between the, you know, the remnant of the membrane and the, and the uh, malleus and you can just slide your graft under that, make sure it doesn't fall off anteriorly and support it. <clears throat> okay, that's great. So, Professor uh, uh, Marus? Uh, well, it actually depends on the position of the handle of malleus. So, if the handle of malleus is actually foreshortened and is very medially placed, uh, then possibly I would actually try to lift off the, uh, the, the, the tympanic membrane from the handle of malleus. But if the handle of malleus is laterally placed, then I would probably tuck the graft in without lifting it off. Okay, that's great. So I want to just ask you now about middle ear packing, because uh, we heard from Mark that he occasionally does it. Uh, do any of you rut routinely pack the middle ear for, a, for a, a normal moringoplasty? And if so, what do you use? So again, if we can go around perhaps one at a time, we'll start with uh, Tom in New York. So the middle ear we're talking about now, do you pack? We need some sound from you, Tom. <clears throat> That's better. How about now? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're on that. That's great. Yeah. I'm not sure why I'm doing that. Um, I just use gel foam. Yeah. I used to use gel film, uh, the, the other form of gel foam, but gel film was canceled for a while, and I just got used to using gel foam. I have the nurses cut small pieces and press it. Then I can lay it into place, and then it kind of expands when it gets a little moisture on it and seems to hold things nicely in place. I don't so, overpack, but I still use gel foam. So for a case like this, which is sort of sitting a bit over the incudistopedial joint, you just put it a little bit lateral to the incus, do you, to support the graft? Yeah, or maybe anterior and posterior to the incus yeah. and okay. inferior to the incus and just let it expand, yes. 
yep, yep. And uh, we'll go over to Saji for that question now about packing of the middle ear, Saji. I use gel fun, <clears throat> and what I do is I, I, I raise the flap, I put the, the graft, and then without the gel fun, I kind of fish back, I, I call it put, put, push back the, the graft through the perforation, back and fold it, and then <clears throat> I pack with gel fun, especially the anterior half of the tympanic cavity. So I'm sure when I turn back the graft and position the, the, the graft that it's underneath the border of the uh, perforation. Because I think that in my experience, most of the tympanoplasty that do not work is with them in the anterior border. So I use Jalfan, especially in the anterior quadrant. Sometimes it's not so necessary in the posterior because you have the support of the, 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 the external auditory canal. And so it, it goes like a straight line. But in the interior portion, I think it's fundamental to have uh, some support. It's my impression. Okay, that's great. Uh, we're just going to go back to uh, Mark and Ali. Uh, yeah. So Mark, what about packing the middle ear? So this is a really reasonably straightforward one. It's a small hole. I used to pack routinely, like it was my standard operating procedure. But uh, I have backed away from that. I, I just... Uh, and uh, that answers, I think you said we'll get back to it, but that answers the question of whether I dry my graft or I don't. I find that in these cases, if I just harvest, uh, you know, the graft and it's fresh and it's still moist, it has some stickiness to it, so you can just slap it under the tympanic membrane and it adheres to the undersurface of it. Uh, and for small perfs, I don't necessarily pack all the time. So it's a case-by-case -case okay. decision. That's great. And Ali, what about in Egypt? Uh, it it it's basically depends on the depth of the middle E. I usually use gel foam to pack the middle E, uh, particularly if it's actually anterior perforation with lack of support. So I, I really make sure that this is the case. But sometimes the uh, middle ear space is not that deep, and you can see that the graft is actually supported by the, uh, by the other ossicles. Then in this situation, you may not need to actually uh, insert any gel foam in. Okay, that's great. Now we're going to go into a more difficult case now. We're going to go to a subtotal perforation. It's also clean most of the time, but occasional intermittent otorrhea, pain with water, and the hearing loss is about 25, 30 decibels now. So the question really is, how do you adapt your technique when there's a subtotal perforation? There's just a very small rim of drum all the way around from, uh, all the way close to the annulus, but all the way around. So we're going to start off with Sadji for this one. We've got a subtotal perforation now. Again, you've got a decent sized canal. Well, it's, uh, but in this case, I will go retroauricular. Yep. And I'm going I'm to raise a, a big flap, you know, from 11 to 6. I will do an exploratory tympanotomy. I will check the position of the malleus. Sometimes it's, it's really, really uh, in a medial position. And sometimes I, I even cut the tendon and gently try to lateralize the chain. Of course, with 30 dB, we have to check the, the, the ossicular chain to, to see if it's, it's working or not. And then, and then you decide, you, you can use fascia or I compose a uh, graft with cartilage and fascia in this kind of situation. I was not really uh, good with cartilage some years ago, but I have been convinced by my assistant that it's, it's pretty good in this kind of situation. Problem with the cartilage, depend on the situation, is that it's, it's opaque and, and you cannot see through the cartilage the middle ear. So in cases where we have uh, the idea that we had a previous bad retraction and, and probably some skin in, in the ear, I'm afraid of the cartilage. But I, I, I think that is in, in this case, I would go with the cartilage underlay. Okay, so it's underlay. And what do you do with the... Uh with the malleus do you put the cartilage lateral to the malleus or medial to it well as i as i said i try first to lateralize a little bit the malleus that's a kind of a tricky maneuver because you have to take care if you if you if you lift up the malleus sometimes you can disrupt the incu uh, incudus opinion joint so you have to be careful with this maneuver uh, i try to trim the cartilage leaving a, 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 a split to to fit the malleus so it's going to be at the level of the malleus uh, anteriorly and posterior and the fascia would be over the mat. Okay. And so can you, uh, so the, my experience with these subtotal perforations is the difficult bit is anterosuperiorly. 
and you've raised a flap from sort of top to bottom, how do you secure it anteriorly? How do you make sure it's going to work anteriorly? That's a very good question. If, if there is a very, very small border, then you have to dig that border and some, sometimes put the fascia, uh, kind of removing the border out of the annulus and, and put it in, fit in the fascia there. So you're going to have a little bit more of support. And of course, for such, we need a perfect vision of the anterior border. And in this case, probably I'm going to do some canaloplasty too to be sure that my position of my graft will be perfect. Good. Thank you very much. So we're going to go back to Thomas in New York. Um, so do you have any variations on that theme that we're going to have a subtotal perforation? Really not. There's a little rim of drum all the way around. It just extends out onto the malleus. How do you repair that? Uh, we need sound again, Thomas. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we got you, I think. I'm on now? Yep, yeah, you're on now. That's right. <laughs> okay. That's funny, it automatically mutes. Um, I use pretty much the same. I like the cartilage idea, you know, where you, you make a groove in the cartilage or <clears throat> an opening to fit the malleus and have it going anterior and posterior the malleus. Um, I make a superiorly based flap. So from, uh, I'd say if 12 o'clock is a short process, I go from 10, uh, I go from 10 all the way around the bottom past six and back up to two, make that relatively wide. I split the flap inferiorly, make a large anterior terrier and a large posterior flap and fold them all the way up. That allows you to really get all the disease out of the ear, explore the eustachian tube, take a curette and scrape under the, the annulus, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It also allows you to excise the medial edges to get fresh edges with a Bellucci scissors or, or the like. And I also think it really helps me with that anterior superior area that is often the site of reperforation or, or incomplete closure of the perforation. So then I after you know I also get a temporalis fascia graft. I agree I would go postericular. I agree that I would do a nice canal plasty on every case. I teach that to the residents. It really helps with the visualization anteriorly. And I'd lay the graft under the malleus but up the walls uh, anteriorly, inferiorly, and posteriorly. Uh, cartilage medial to that, gel foam in the middle ear, and then I'd rotate my anterior and posterior flaps back on top of the grafts and medialize them a bit again to close down the size of the perforation um, and then pack with gel foam um, and that's pretty that's much good. similar Thanks. to what's been described. So similar to Saji but you're actually raising it off the anterior canal wall to stabilize it at the front really you're making a bigger flap. Yes and that way I have the graft up the canal wall and then the flap over that to really make sure I don't have an opening. Yeah but you're doing that post -auricular. so I'm going to go to Robert because I think he might have a slightly different take on this. Are you there Robert? Robert? No. Robert? No, okay. We'll, we'll leave Robert because he's, uh, he's obviously busy. Um, so, Ali, do you have any variations? This is a subtotal perforation no. now, very little residual drum. How do you do it? I actually approach it very similar to uh, Dr. Roland from uh, the USA. Uh, the, probably the only difference is that uh, I would tend to make a separate incision. Uh, along the anterior meatal wall and and that incision would be just to actually uh, take the um, the perichondrum out, uh, out, out I would actually deepen it to the annulus anteriorly then I would actually pull the uh, the uh, the tragal perichondrium through this uh, hole uh, and, and that, that, that would be a separate incision from the curvy linear incision from 12 o'clock to, to 6 o'clock um, but but, yeah. but uh, essentially the same. Okay, so we're going to go on to now to Mark. Uh, Mark, what I'd like you to tell us is how do you deal with a drum which has got uh, a reasonably large central perforation, but almost all of the residual drum has got dense tympanal sclerosis. So we don't think there's any tympanal sclerosis of the acicular chain, but the drum itself is heavily calcified. What do you do with those? Mind if I take a second just to just to comment on the previous uh, case? Yes, of course, of course, of course. So, so I, I agree with you. The trick here is is really the anterior superior component. Uh, this is where most of the failures happen. And I think there are a couple little things that you can do to avoid that. One is 
you know, what uh, Dr. Roland described as the superior base flap, uh, which I, you know, call the loop tympanoplasty. Uh, the second is incising that uh, uh, tympanometal flap, kind of opening it. I, you know, I've heard the term uh, open book uh, flap, so you just open it and you can get a better view. I think the two other things you can do is, this might be a good case to elevate the drum off of the uh, uh, handle of the malleus, gives you a better visibility in the anterior uh, superior component. And one, one thing that you could consider is cutting the tendon of the um, tensor tympani. That gives you a bit of more room to just slide that graft under the malleus up in that anterior superior component. So these are little tricks to keep in mind to just make sure you get that graft in proper place, uh, sometimes supported with cartilage, but get good packing in the anterior superior area to get to avoid the uh, risk of failure perforation or the graft falling anteriorly. So that, that's it for that previous case. Uh, the the yeah. question about- What about tympanostorosis, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so the meningosclerosis- we, we have to go to the auditorium as well at some okay. stage. Well, just, just take this okay. one point, John, okay. and then we'll go to the auditorium, okay. yeah. Okay. So, so Mark, what do you do with tympanostorosis? Dense tympanostorosis. Yeah, yeah so, so um, I have, uh, you know, I think I would tend to remove that, especially in the vicinity of the perforation. Uh, most of the tympanosclerotic plaques are medial, you know, so you can dissect them easily and be left with a viable layer of fibrous and uh, epithelial tympanic membrane. Um, I don't necessarily go, you know, on, on a full cleaning spree of the entire tympanic membrane, especially if the, the parts that are far from the uh, from the perf, but especially in the vicinity of the perf, really what I'm getting at is I need fresh edges healthy edges that are bleeding, oozing at the end of the, of the cleaning. So you can get the epithelial cells growing back, which as we said, is the, is the main principle here. Um, but the, I don't know if your question also means, do these plaques affect the movement of the membrane? Are they thick and big? And, and Not so much and like, that. What I was trying to get at is that sometimes you get an eardrum, which has got a huge amount of tympanic sclerosis. And some people say, take the plaques out, in which case you're left with very little drum. Now, it's, it's right. fine if it's a small block. Uh, it's quite easy to dissect. I agree with you. But when they're really big, sometimes it's really quite tricky. And you have to make the decision. Do you do a limited resection, which I think you're describing? Do you just freshen the edges or do you take the whole thing out and make it into a subtotal perforation? But I think we, no, I we get from you that you do a limited resection. Yeah. 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 Um, no, with freshening okay, John, I think we're going to go to the Zoom room now and get some questions. Right, we're getting lots of questions coming in, some of which right. I think will be straightforward. I mean, the first one was, does the panel favour conchal or tragal cartilage when repairing a small perforation? So if I can answer that one first, John, um, I always use tragal, but that's because I'm doing these small perforations per orally, and it just allows you to do it all in the same site. You don't have to... Uh, it's easy to get to. The incision's very neat. It's tucked on the inside of the tragus, uh, one or two absorbable sutures, uh, and you're less likely to get a hematoma, I think. Okay. Can well, we, Rich, give, yeah. can we, can, okay, can we give that question, yes. maybe just give that question to Thomas as well in, uh, in New York, because Thomas, I think, was using cartilage. Uh, where do you get your cartilage from, Tom? If I'm going transcanal, I use tragal, and if I'm going posterior, I use control because it's just easily accessible. Great, that's clear. So, John, let's have our next okay. question. Uh, Mauricio Kirk, uh, do you start your antibiotic drops right away or prefer to wait two to three weeks to start them after the tympanoplasty? So, keep that with Thomas. So, I am um, in the external canal packing. I usually put the packing in relatively dry and then expand it with an antibiotic drop. And then I leave that. I don't use any drops at all because I want that to form like a nice gelatin plug and let epithelial migration occur. Then I usually see them back <clears throat> in three weeks, and then I remove uh, about half the packing, and then I start them on antibiotic drops for one more week, and then see them back three more weeks, and it's usually healed by then and remove the remaining gel foam if there is any left. Do you have a favorite? Would it be ofloxacin or kiprofloxacin, or do you have something else that you use? Um, I don't like fluxin or ofloxacin because it's pH, uh, strangely, and I seem to have had a number of fungal infections post-op, so I stopped using that. Um, if I haven't, you know, feel there's any danger, I actually use gentamicin drops. It's dirt cheap. It's easy. It's pH balanced for the eye, and uh, it has anti-pseudomonal and anti-staph 
features. So I like um, and and ciprofloxacin or ciprodex uh, is very very expensive. Some somewhere in the order of hundreds of dollars for a five milliliter bottle. And gentamicin is very inexpensive. Yeah. God, we're lucky. Sometimes we use a tried court reloading substitute in the UK, which is manufactured in Ian's unit, I think, in Oxford. But uh, perhaps we go on. There's a question here from PN Tajanka in India. Do you address the adenoids in young children before moringoplasty? So I think we'll give that one to Saji. Yeah. Moringoplasty. Do you look at the children's adenoids before you operate? Oh, if they have symptoms, yes. Well, whenever I do an exam of a child, I do it entirely. So, of course, not only the adenoids, but the tonsils and everything. I think we have to, we need, as in any other case, a complete physical examination. Uh, and if it's necessary, of course, you can remove it. And I can, if it's not a really a big deal, you can do it at the same time. But it's, it's really hard to do that. I would like to come back, uh, Chris, to the question of the tympanous sclerosis, if I can. Yes, yes. Well, we, we know that tympanous sclerosis is the yellinization of the subepithelial collagen, and there are two types of tympanous sclerosis. The one that uh, stays in the surface, uh, probably the one that you mentioned, like over the tympanic membrane, and another one very aggressive that goes through the middle ear, fixing the ossicles, and sometimes uh, kind of cementing uh, over the yeah, promontory. Yeah. Yeah. So you're talking about the first one. We are. If, we a, are. if it's a small plaque of tympanous sclerosis, I think you should left it alone. But if it's a big plaque, we have a study with the uh, computer program that we call it the Cyclopsaurus, measuring these plaques and, 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 and kind of uh, trying to make a correlation with the, the airborne gap. And, and the bigger the plaque, the bigger the gap. So if you have a big plaque uh, and it's not going inside the middle ear, I think that it's a good idea to remove part of this plaque, even to freshen up uh, the borders of the, the epithelium that you have in the tympanic membrane to start with the, uh, the healing process. So how much do you take? Because the, the one I, unfortunately we haven't got the slides, but the one I wanted to show you, the whole drum was tympanous sclerotic, but the hole was quite small. How much do you take? I think Mark was saying a relatively limited amount, but what do you think? Well, actually, uh, uh, well, I, I can't see the, the plaque that you're talking about, but... Uh, I'm sure you can imagine it. Uh, yeah, I can, <laughs> I can, and I have a good imagination. I, I, I would go, if it's very thick, I think I would go almost for everything. No, if right. it's very okay. thick, right? Okay. Chris, okay. Chris, yep. uh, Chris, can I add a point here? Um, regarding the Myringo sclerotic patch, uh, I would actually look at the patch and see how far is it from the edge of the perforation of the tympanic membrane? And if there is a distance between it and the edge of the perforation, particularly if the, uh, if the part um, uh, uh, harboring the perforation of the tympan tympanic membrane looks reasonably okay, I would probably leave the plaque as it is. But if the plaque is at the edge of the perforation, which means that I cannot really refresh in the edge, then I would actually remove the plaque itself. Okay, yeah, it's fine. I've got another one here, Chris, that's yep. coming. Yep. Quite an interesting one from Dr. Navid Prasad to all of the panelists. When you make the decision to open the mastoid in tympanoplasty, I, I assume they mean he means a cortical to, to okay. inspect the mastoid. Uh, perhaps we could put that one to the panel. Okay, so I think we'll start with Mark on that. What's your feeling on that, Mark, about uh, mastoidectomy, cortical mastoidectomy in, for moringoplasty? I, th I think really that's where history comes in. So it depends of, you know, on, on why they're having this perforation, uh, what happened, and what's been happening since the perforation. If it's a chronically, like I just did, did one not too long ago, it was a small 20% perforation but it was constantly training no matter how aggressively you treated with oral or topical antibiotics and these i just get a sense that there is a biofilm or some chronic uh, mild underlying uh, you know automastoiditis that's going on for a while uh, these are the patients that i scan and i talk to them about mastoidectomy for for uh, you know cleaning any residual and then improving aeration which gets me to the other point uh, so if it's a small perf that i think is due to as saji described a chronic retraction that turned into a perforation. I want to look at the ventilation pathways of the middle ear. You know, eustachian tube is one, but also mastoid aeration and and uh, patency of the uh, aditus uh, is another reason where I would consider 
doing an, a limited cortical mastectomy. So these are the two categories, so, if you want. So can I just develop that a little bit with you? So the patient comes in on the yep. day with their perforation. You've seen them in clinic. I don't know how long before you see them, but we quite often see them quite a long time before. And on the day, right. the perforation is discharging. Do you, what do you do then? Do you cancel the operation? Do you treat them medically or do you just operate? With a, yeah, a perforation they're, they're discharging they're on the day. Well. If they're discharging on the day of surgery, then I treat it medically and, you know, I just delay that surgery. It's an elective surgery. I want to put all my chances. I want to improve my chances. But what I'm talking about is a history of a chronic, chronically draining perforation. Somebody that you yep. see, whether you've seen them for years or they come in and tell you they've been draining for years and years and years. And you see this, you know, 15, 20 percent perforation that just isn't very impressive on its own. But it's just a it's just a sick looking ear that does just does not want to heal on its own. And then that's where I think of a chronic mastoid disease. Okay. Well, let's ask some of the others what they do for that. Um, so if we go to Saji, uh, so yeah. we've got a, there's two questions there. What do you do if it's, if it's unexpectedly discharging on the day of perforate of operation? Uh, 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 if in this OR, I would go ahead and do the surgery. <clears throat> yeah, me but, too. Uh, I would do that. Yeah. yeah. I would wash and use antibiotics and then I would go ahead and do this. Surgery. Yeah. Regarding the question about the mastoid, uh, that's yeah. a beautiful question, actually. And and of course, we are talking only about meringoplasty. You rarely exactly. you're going to open the mastoid. But most of the cases, you are not doing only meringoplasty. You are doing meringoplasty, exploratory tympanotomy, and sometimes tympanoplasty. Anyway, uh, there is a professor here in Brazil, Professor Tassilo, that used to say uh, in a very funny way. So. Whenever I use them, when I, I open the mask, when, I'm, when I am in doubt, when I have no doubt. So that's the only two conditions that they open the mask. Well, how I do, uh, we have to examine the profile of the perforation because we're talking here like, you know, patch and perforation. That's not the point. You have to understand the disease. So in my opinion and our experience, we have two ways of developing these perforations. This clean, you know, king-shaped perforation that we call it's a... Out, uh, inside out perforation that could be the end result of a, a, an accident or a, with near normal physiology. And in most of the cases here in Brazil now, that is uh, clear signs of previous retraction. And I consider that a stage of an ongoing process. In this situation, I order a CT scan. And if the CT scan suggests me that would be a nice idea, a good idea to open up the mouse I would go on and open. And what do you do with the mastoid? Do you just make sure you can rinse through, open up into the attic and rinse through? I mean, how much do, do you do a posterior tympanotomy? What do you do for these ones? Well, actually, uh, I'm going to show in the next section a, a case like that, Chris. I would. Uh, OK, well, let's leave, leave it for them. Leave yeah. it for them. Okay. Like exactly answer your question. Yeah, no, great. It's great. It's, I don't do that. I don't open the mastoid. I just repair the hole. But there we go. If it's a central hole, Thomas. Uh, Some Sometimes, Chris, and I saw yeah. a question here. Yeah. The hole is good. The hole is not always bad. And I remember one case that I, I came, a child came to me with a small perforation. I wrote about that in a book. And I did a tympanoplasty. It was fine. Six months later, or even less than that, the kid came back with hearing loss. There is fluid in the ear. So I wait for three months, and I decided to put the ventilation tube. And then the father came to me and said, well, let me understand. There was a hole there, and you patch it. And I said, yes. Now, now it's closed, yes. And you, you want to bring back the hole? So we have to be very keen on, on which perforation we're going to close. Not Indeed. everybody. I mean, sometimes Indeed. perforation is good. It's like a I'm ventilation. Just I'm just going to go to uh, Thomas and ask a little bit about that, about the, the discharging perforation and the role of cortical mastoidectomy. And I have to say, Tom, your nails look very good. Thank you. I, uh, <laughs> I, I chopped off part of my finger last ooh, night cooking. Ooh, 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 ooh. And they let, you, and they let you operate on patients? Blimey. <laughs> I'm going to go do three cases next. Um, so, uh, uh, I, um, so regarding the discharging year in the day of surgery, it, you know, obviously if it's really nasty looking, I would, I would say, I'm sorry, we should probably clean this up and come back another day. But it's not uncommon, and sometimes it's very hard to get an ear to stop discharging. That's one of the reasons you're doing the surgery. And I will irrigate like crazy, and I'll, I'll uh, keep them on post-operative oral antibiotics, uh, as, w um, as well as put the, the antibiotic drops on the gel foam. 
regarding the cortical mastoidectomy, I'm not a big fan of just cortical mastoidectomy. I, I believe in complete mastoidectomies. And if you're going to open the mastoidectomy, the purpose is to eradicate disease, open the additus ad antrum, create all the ventilation path, pathways. And if I open the mastoid on any uh, chronic ear case, I also open the posterior tympanotomy facial recess. It's another route to ventilation, and it gives you a nice view um, of the posterior uh, oval window area uh, um, for other disease or for scar tissue or for adhesions, whatever. Um, sometimes, you know, um, if you can even take the incus bar down a little bit, but still leave the incus to, to look carefully. So I kind of feel like, we, you know, we, we, um, we have a public hospital right next door, Bellevue, the oldest public hospital in the country. And we see patients from all over the world with ears that have been draining for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And they want us to try to close these uh, horrible perforations. Um, so we do mastoidectomies on all of them. Okay, that's great. I think we'd like to just see if there are any more questions from the room now. John? Yeah, there are a couple more. There's, there's one here, which I suppose we all have our own view on, uh, from Sharma Bellad. Do you routinely check for eustachian tube function preoperatively? And if yes, how? I presume so I think the, if there's a perforation in one yeah, ear, I presume that yeah. means. So I think this is one of the questions I was going to ask is that you, we tend to use the other ear as a, a guide. So we've got a perforation, the other ear looks great, we feel quite happy. I'd quite like to ask my panel, if the patient comes and they've got a perforation, but the other ear has either got an effusion or a significant retraction, what do they do about that? And have they got any tricks on how to uh, maybe perhaps improve you station tube function? So I'm going to go to Ali in Cairo to start us with that, if you could comment on that for us. So the other ear has either got an effusion or a retraction. I think uh, that I would take this into account in terms of counseling this patient because the, prog the prognosis would vary uh, whether the contralateral ear is actually uh, normal functioning or not. Uh, so it all really depends on <clears throat> the primary complaint of the patient. I would like to know the burning symptom of the patient first and then tailor the management accordingly. Uh, in other words, uh, if the primary complaint of the patient is actually a discharge, the e that has the perforation, then I would probably delay things and give some medical treatment, uh, probably uh, give a, uh, uh, or offer a ventilation tube to the other E where there is a effusion. Um, and I would actually try to look at the post nasal space as well and look at the nose and address the nasal issue with this. Uh, so I would approach this patient with a bit of cautious uh, because, because the prognosis is a little bit guarded uh, compared to a, a normal looking contralateral E. Okay, so perhaps we can go to Mark now. So have you got any other way of assessing eustachian tube function in a perforated ear yeah. other than the opposite ear? And if the opposite ear is unhealthy, what steps might you take to improve the situation? Mark, we've got no sound from you at the moment. Can you hear me now? Okay. Now we can hear you. Yeah, right, that's sorry. great. Thank you. Yeah. I was saying that looking at the other ear remains the best, uh, you know, way to assess the function of the station tube in a patient, and and just the history again of what happened before, what led to this perforation, uh, is important. Now, if you see that the other ear is not healthy, if there are signs of eustachian tube dysfunction on the other side. Uh, such an effusion or a retraction, uh, then I would consider because I am, you know, I'm a proponent of eustachian tube dilation, balloon dilation. Uh, I would consider doing that, and I've been doing this recently. I don't have enough long-term, uh, you know, outlook to to tell you what the outcomes are, but in the short term, I think that's been helping, and I can see the other ear, you know, the ventilation comes back. Um, I think it will down down the road reduce the risk. So of on that retraction. on that point. Do you do that yes. at the time of surgery or do you do it as a separate procedure? Do you do the tuberplasty, see what happens to the other ear and then operate or what do you do? I, I do it before. I do it before because I think, at least in my experience, is you know it takes a while for the eustachian tube function to recover when you do the dilation. It's not like you know they get out and they can valsalva and everything goes back to normal. And after the, the dilation, I have them valsalva aggressively. Uh, so that would potentially compromise the, the outcomes of a tympanoplasty. So I treat the station tube dysfunction first, 
and then you know give give ourselves a couple months uh, and then reassess if everything works fine. Then we go in for for tympanoplasty. The other thing to consider and is ha- using. Can I just ask a, a practical point there? If they're valve salvering and they've got a perforation, how do they do that? You say you get them to say aggressively valve salva. After the eustachian yeah, tuberplasty, before, you say you get them to yeah. valve salva, but they've got a perforation. So do they put their right. finger in their ear? No, they just they just block their nose and push. And my, the, the, what I, what I want is air going through that eustachian tube, forcing that eustachian tube. I know that, but does it not leak that. through? Does it not just leak through the other ear? If they've got a perforation. It, it, I think it goes through both ears. I mean, I've never, I guess that's a question, I've never, okay. yeah, yeah. And you, you don't worry about blowing air through the post-nasal space through the perforation, up the eustachian tube and out through the perforation? No, not really. No. In the, okay, that's, the, fine. In the that's fine, that's fine, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, Okay, I'm just going to ask think, the rest of the panel if no, any of the others do you stick tuberplasty if they do you station tuberplasty so we're going to go if you if you do that can you raise your hand for me if you do you station tuberplasty no so i think you're the oh yeah we've got thomas so thomas let's uh go back to you okay tom can you hear me yeah we can hear you that's great yeah okay yeah i i um don't do it but i have three other members of the department that do do it and i have rarely on occasion asked them to come in and go ahead and do it during my procedure or I'll just turn the case over to them. And what would make you do that? What makes you think of that? Maybe, uh, you know, failed um, tympanoplasty, maybe um, a long history of, um, uh, you know, drainage and just look, you know, the middle ear mucosa doesn't look so healthy, doesn't look like reversible mucosal damage. Um, and um, I have on two occasions seen kind of adenoinectomies gone awry where they're scarring around the eustachian tube. And um, in one case, it was completely scarred over. So we plast the balloon in the reverse direction through the ear, saw the light, and then used a debrider and opened up the, uh, the torus and put in a stent for six, uh, for six months. And the, the child's actually ventilating his ear now, which is interesting. I wasn't sure that was going to work. Thank you. John, have we got any more questions from the Zoom room? Yeah, Chris, maybe Dwayne, I can just Dwayne, Dwayne, yeah. Yeah, come on, Dwayne. So, um, on this question of the eustachian tube, uh, one Mohammed Alami says, what about the indication for a CT scan? We sometimes see a well aerated mastoid on the one side and a very poorly master, uh, aerated mastoid on the other. So assessing the other ear as your indication might be uh, wrong. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I, in, if it was, if it was, the other ear was normal, uh, unless it was chronically discharging, I would not do a CT scan personally, but I shall ask my esteemed panel what they think. Uh, so we're going to go to uh, Ali in Cairo. What's the role of CT uh, I, scanning? Do you do that routinely for moringoplasty? No, not really. No, I wouldn't do a CT scan at all to assess the station tube function, as I understood from the question. So no, the answer is no. No, no. Okay. Uh, anyone else do that routinely? I think no, I, see, no, I don't I do it got... routinely. But I think what Dwayne, what Dwayne was referring to is the fact that you know when you, we do on the, in the cases where we do a CT scan, you see that the ventilation pattern of the two ears are separate, are different. So the fact that yeah. one ear is fine does not necessarily mean that the other ear will be fine once we fix the perforation. Of is course. that what you're saying, Dwayne? Yep, that, that's yep. what the, the question is, and that was what I was saying. That's in my experience that yep. I found that. So if there is something that's worrying me, yeah, and I, and I, I think that's a really doing a CT scan. Yeah. But uh, then those are the draining years, the chronic years, the child that maybe is now 15 years old that's had this problem for many years, then you know the mastoid hasn't developed. Yet. So yeah. there's a little bit more other improvement. Um, maybe just another question here. They were talking about, so you've got bilateral perforations, they're draining. How do you decide which ear to do first if you don't do CT scanning on them? I know this is a little bit different. This is not a straightforward moringoplasty. That was from Rahul Gupta. Okay, I mean, I think if they're the same perforation with the same discharge and the same hearing, there's not an awful lot to choose. Sometimes I will say to the patient, if they drive a lot, I'll do their, in in the UK, where we've got the steering wheel on the right, I would do their left hand ear because that's close to the passengers. But really, uh, I think uh, if the ears are the same, there's not, there's, not much, course, Chris. there's not much to Sometimes. choose, really. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. If they're driving with their wife, they probably don't want that ear doing. If it's with their <laughs> girlfriend or boyfriend, yeah. maybe. Yeah, I think if they have similar ears, there's probably not a lot to choose as far as I'm aware. I don't know. Anyone on our panel got thoughts on that? Flip the coin. Flip the coin. Uh, I'd quite like to ask the panel about their post-operative management. So uh, in terms of packing, cleaning the ears, uh, how long they expect for recovery and flying and swimming. So we're going to start with somewhere where swimming is popular in Brazil with Saji. Can you tell us about that? What do you do post-operatively with your patients? Sure. But it's funny, you know, I don't know what happens with you guys. Sometimes the patients came to me and say, well, I have this perforation, it doesn't bother me, but I would like to swim without protection and, and, and so I, I would like it to be fixed. And, we, and then we do this tympanoplasty, it goes well and, and there is, uh, you know, the tympanic membrane is intact and I say, well, go ahead and swim. It's no, no, I'm not going to swim. Well, but why? It's, no, no, no. I just want to know, I, I just would like to know that I have this perforation closed, but uh, I will not swim anyway. So, this <laughs> okay. is, uh, it happens all the time, that's the point. But uh, what I do, and I pack with gel foam, and I start with ear drops. And we use uh, superfluxacin here in Brazil because it's, it's not so expensive at the United States. And also, if you, if you read the bulla of the gentamicin, it will say to the patient that it's not supposed to use in cases of perforation. We know that we will not probably have any major problem, but if it does, then we get in trouble. So I, I do not advise to use uh, drops with mycin, at least in our country. Anyway, and then we use one or twice a, a day eardrops, and then in 10 days, I see the patient remove the suture if you have some, and start suctioning the gel one, and then two more weeks, and probably the, the process will be complete. But I will wait at least for three months to, to let them to uh, take the shower and, and to swim. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. So we're going to go to Tom now in New York just for post-operative management. Uh, we're, we're running a little bit short on time, so just make it snappy. Yeah, I think I covered it. Uh, I, yeah. I put antibiotic drops on the gel foam. Yeah. I leave it and alone for jazz. three weeks. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, obviously if I'm worried about a fistula or, you know, or something, but these years are all scarred. I've never had uh, ototoxicity from just being in on the packing. And then I leave it alone for three weeks. I don't even see them for three weeks. There's no point. And then at three weeks, I see them remove half the packing, start them on drops at nighttime only for another three weeks or two weeks. And then by that time it's healed, I clean out the ear and they're on their way. I tell them they can shower and get it wet uh, if everything looks good. Okay, so they're going to be showering from about six weeks and swimming? They can swim then? Or a bit longer? Yeah, if, if everything looks okay. What about and flying? Just, what about, what about flying? Let's come in. Two questions on that. Yeah, two questions on flying. Yeah. What about flying? flying I would say, I would say, uh, if it looks like they have air in the middle of the ear and the eustachian tube is working, I don't see any reason why they can't fly at six weeks. Brilliant. Thank you. And if we go back to uh, Ali in Cairo, what about uh, flying after surgery? How long do you keep yours off flying? Uh, it really depends on, because I would assist my, all my patients post-operatively. So when I look at them and see that the eardrum has healed up well and the middle ear ventilation is reasonably okay, then I would I'd advise them to fly. So it varies from one patient to another, really. So I don't think there's any blanket role here. So what about the businessman who comes to see you and before his operation, he says, look, I need to fly. When am I going to be flying again? Well, I, I think that... that, that that's a good question. I would be uh, dead honest with that uh, person. I'd say it all depends on how things would go after surgery. Uh, and I, if, if my assessment is that the tube function before surgery is reasonably okay, then probably I would say fly within two to three weeks, generally speaking. But I would not commit myself to this. I would always say it, it all depends on what happens after surgery. Okay, brilliant. And Mark, do you want to take that question too? Yeah, I'm actually, um, I think I'm very liberal on that. I have really no restrictions on flying. I let them fly whenever they want. I would prefer that they fly early when I pack them at the gel foam because then they're not much affected by, you know, pressure, barometric pressure changes. Uh, there's a period of time between, I think, two weeks to four weeks when the middle ear starts to clear. 
they're a bit uncomfortable, but I don't worry about, you know, about having any damage to the ear. So whether in tympanoplasty, tympanostoid, stapedectomy, I just, I tell them my patients, they can fly whenever they want. So I get a few okay. patients from the Middle East and they usually go home a week out from surgery. Okay. And we're just going to go around now. What I want to ask everybody now is how much they charge their patients for a straightforward moringoplasty. Can you, can you share that with us? Mark, do you, are your patients state funded or are they privately funded? Uh, you don't I'm have to answer if you that. don't want to, but I'm just, in, I think a no, lot no, of people no, listening would be that. interested it's, to know. It's, it's not that, it's just that, you know, in, in dollar amount, that question varies by the day right now in Lebanon. Uh, it's <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, but the average amount before, before the economic crisis was, if I'm not mistaken for private pay, somebody who's just coming paying out of pocket, I think it was about 3,000 all inclusive. Uh, hospital and surgical so that's fees, the, all inclusive. Three thousand dollars ish. Yeah. That's sort of the fee. Yeah. And it, Ali, it, in, in Egypt, course, are your are your patients private? The well, insured or well, they self pay? And how much do they, they charge? Get uh, charged? Some are, some aren't. But privately, I can tell you, if you compare it with the sterling, is peanuts. So it's just very few. <laughs> but in other words, send us your and, patient. Okay. Sorry. And Saji, Saji, you must. Oh, I pay them a snack and a Coke after the surgery. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom, no, it must, with, be, it must with be... be... With the dollar drop here in Brazil, I would feel embarrassed to, tell, to answer this question. So <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. don't want to put you on the spot, but it must be hugely <laughs> expensive in New York, Tom. Well, actually, our, our medical uh, reimbursement system is so messed up, so I can get as little as zero. Uh, and maybe as much as $3,500, uh, you know, when I was purely private practice and, you know, people would come to me because they thought I could do a better job than somebody else, which may, they may have not really been thinking clearly, but, um, I, um, we could charge as much as maybe $5,000 for, uh, you know, uh, tympanoplasty with cartilage and all the pre and post operative cares included. And is that the surgeon's fee? That's the surgeon fee. The, the, uh, they're all done outpatient. So there's a hospital fee. There's an anesthesia fee. It's all kind of strangely unbundled. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your honesty. Chris, everybody. Chris, 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 yeah. Chris yeah. who yeah. asks that, the that question needs to answer it too. Sorry? Uh, who is asking the question needs to answer it too, Mr. Chairman. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, 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 it depends. It, it, it depends if, if, and you know, if it's if paid in dollars or, or in pounds. Uh, but it, I mean, uh, dollars and pounds are about the same now. Um, so we, we, our fee is about probably about three and a half thousand, four thousand pounds. But that's all in, and the surgeon's going to get somewhere between five hundred and fifteen hundred pounds, depending whether they're insured or whether they're self-pay. The self-pay we charge more. Uh, so that's Chris. a sort of typ typical fee. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Chris, Chris. Yeah. In, yeah. In, such in, a... my, in my opinion, five thousand dollars for a meringoplasty is my vision of paradise. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, Slough, of course, has, is, is many people's vision of paradise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'd like to thank my panel for their honesty. I think it's been a, a really interesting session. It's been very helpful for me. Um, I just want to very briefly summarise. And I think the summary that we can take away is that most people feel that straightforward moringoplasty is a successful operation. Uh, we, most of us think we're going to get about 90% closure. And if we don't get closure, we think the chance of making the patient worse is very small. However, we do have quite a difference in our, uh, our take on how to do it. Some of us are doing it per oral, some end orally, some post auricularly. We're using cartilage, cartilage and perichondrium separately, fascia, uh, uh, so there's a variety of different materials. Nobody was using artificial materials, which was interesting. Um, for the subtotal, I think most people were aware that the anterior superior area is tricky, and some of us were raising a lot of the anterior annulus to get an onlay onto the front wall. Uh, a number of people were approaching those post auricularly, and some people were doing canaloplasty. Um, gel foam seems to be used by a number of people in the middle ear and certainly for packing the ear canal, although some of us are using less gel foam and laying the graft on top of the malleus and up the posterior canal wall. Uh, we had a nice present uh, talk from Mark, unfortunately didn't see the video, about his push-through technique of uh, using fat graft. 
Uh, and I think uh, that's probably about it. It seems like Sadji's got very good weather and beer, but really, really wants Tom's fees for surgery. So thank you all so much for your help. There's going to be another uh, presentation from the committee, and then we're going to have a final session on mastoid surgery. Thanks very much to all of you. And also thanks to Duane and uh, John in the Zoom room.